Hello everyone. In this video, we want to talk about the meaning of mode shapes. I mean, uh, when you do a um, free vibration response, when you solve a free vibration response, there are two things that you will get. One is the set of uh, natural frequencies and the other one are those mode shapes, those vectors. So the natural frequencies are uh, kind of easier to understand because those are the frequencies at which the system will uh, oscillate, right, uh, under uh, no external force. But what are those mode shapes, what are those vectors going to mean, right, what's the meaning of them? So here, uh, with the 2DOF system, I'm going to show you uh, the meaning. So here you have uh, two masses with two springs. And here we have void dampers, although we can add them. And one end is fixed. There is no ex uh, extra forces. We move the system from uh, the uh, equilibrium to some uh, offset and then uh, to some uh, x10 and x20 and then leave it, uh, release it from rest. And you know that the system will start oscillating. So here we use these values for m's and k's. Uh, the equation of motion in this case is basically mx double dot equals to the sum of the spring forces. Now for, uh, again, here you can make some assumptions like assume that, for example, x2 is bigger than x1 or x1 bigger than x2, doesn't matter. So uh, if you do that, then the force applied to m1 is going to be basically k1 times x2 minus x1 and again the positions are all measured from static equilibrium so gravity will not be included so you'll get m1 x1 double dot equals as i said k1 times x2 minus x1 which is exactly uh, the first row equation and then m2 x2 double dot equals basically negative of that force so it's going to be k1 times x1 minus x2 and then minus k2 times x2 so you're going to get this one and uh, clearly you see the k matrix is symmetric and m matrix is symmetric as well and diagonal and if i plug in those numbers this is the uh, set of equations you will get you can also write it in matrix format as uh, k uh, x double dot equals m inverse k times x where k here is this matrix in this case and m is this matrix okay and if you invert m and multiply by k that's the solution you will get and uh, you know that also uh, if you have a harmonic response in the case of free vibrations we should do free response x double dot is also negative lambda squared times x or um, negative uh, omega you might call it the squared omega and squared times x and so what you need to find basically is to find the eigenvalues of negative m inverse times k why negative because you multiply both sides by a negative so it becomes negative m inverse times k times x equals some scalar times x and that is an eigenvalue eigenvector problem where you need to basically find what this um, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of negative m inverse k. In this case, negative m inverse k is this matrix. And if you find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors using the command eig in MATLAB, the eigenvectors are these two. And the eigenvalues are going to be... Um, now, uh, here I have to... Uh, basically convert this to lambda if I want those to be square root of lambda so I have to change this to lambda okay so uh, let me get rid of that it has to be only lambda if these are to be square root or I can call them omega 1 and omega 2 and then um, it's fine so if you use lambda here the square root of them are the natural frequency so this is basically omega n number one and this is omega n number two and so these are the natural frequencies so if the system is going to vibrate it is going to have uh, in general two frequencies the 4.155 and the 14.239 radians per second now what's the meaning of the mode shape so uh, one way to explain it is this here uh, for uh, mode v1 right for mode shape v1 for this vector 
This is when the system is only operating in uh, using the first frequency. The only frequency you see in the free response of the system is just frequency one. In that case, the relative position between displacements of mass one, right, which is on the top, and mass two, which is at the bottom, is like the ratio of these two numbers. So this is for mass one and this is for mass two. So if mass one goes down by negative 0.83, mass two goes down by negative 0.54. Again, when the system is only operating with frequency of 4.15, okay? So this guy goes down negative 0.8 something, this guy goes down negative 0.5 something, okay? They go down together, they go up together, kind of like a synchronous motion really right and um, not rigid motion there is relative displacement between them but they go in the same direction and in the second uh, mode shape the system is now only operating in frequency two and again here the meaning of a relative displacement for them is Mass 1, if it goes 0.3 upward, positive. Mass 2 goes negative 0.9 downward. So in the second scenario, this guy goes up a little bit. This guy goes down a lot more. And because of that, there is some point in between here that you can see. And this point doesn't move. Okay, Because when you pass from positive to negative displacement, there is a point with zero displacement. And that point, we call it a node, okay? So in any mode shape that you see a point has zero displacement, that is called a node. And I'll explain node more when we go down to explain it about the string. But uh, that is called a node. So uh, the meaning of V1 and V2 is, in a simple way, is the relative displacement between the uh, motions of the blocks or the masses of the system when the system is operating in only those individual frequencies and not a combination. Okay, now uh, that might not be super uh, nice and clean, so, uh, or not super motivating, let's say. It, it, would, it was clean, I would say it was clear what uh, the explanation was, but I guess it was not motivating enough. So here I want to motivate you again with another way to explain it. So here, let's look at the free vibration uh, of the same system from rest with some non-zero initial conditions where you move block one, one meter up and block two, 0.65 meters up and then let them go. And you might say, where did you get these numbers from? Well, the numbers here, the ratio between these two numbers is the same as what? The ratio between the numbers in V1. So if you divide negative 0.5 by negative 8, uh, 0.54 by 8.3, that's the exact ratio of between 0.65 and 1. If I do that, I pass those initial conditions, velocity 0, positions are these, and use the MATLAB command dsolve to solve the second order differential equation, this one, the linear one for me with these numbers. These are the two responses that I will get. Look at them. The uh, x1 versus time is just going to be 1 times cosine of 4, uh, 15t. x2 is going to be 0.654 uh, cosine of 4, 1, 15t. And you see, the only frequency you see now the system is operating at is only the first frequency. Look at that. You see, it's only omega and 1. So what happened... Because I chose the relative displacement between my initial conditions of the two blocks, the same as the uh, ratio of the numbers in the um, uh, first mode shape. So basically your x naught, right, is parallel to what? V1. Okay, right? Yes, or the cross of that is zero. It's an integer multiple of the other one. Then they are basically showing the same direction. Your vector x0 and vector v1 are showing the same, not direction, the same line of action. Because this, this one is both positive, this one is both negative. They are on the same line. 
then the only frequency activated is only frequency number one. On the other hand, I can show you if I change my initial condition and this time I use x1 at 0, 1 and x2 at 0, negative 3.05. And again, you might say, where did you get these numbers? The ratio between these two is again the exact ratio between this number and this number in the uh, mode shape 2. So here, now I force my vector x0 to be what? Parallel to mode shape 2. Then, if I use dsolve in MATLAB and get the free response, now look, the only, the only frequency activated is only frequency number 2. Right? And it's interesting that the values here, the amplitudes, are the same as those initial conditions, both here and what? Here, as you can see. Because you are starting from rest, of course. So you see? If I choose my initial condition to be in the same line of action with any of these mode shapes, only I will activate that related frequency, the corresponding frequency of that mode shape. On the other hand, now if I don't use any of these two ratios, and I go with some other ratio like 1 and 1. Here, 1 and 1 is not parallel to what? We 1, and it's not parallel to what? to v2 then i should expect both of my uh, frequencies to appear in the free response and you see they do now if i get my x1 and x2 from d solve look i see both of the frequencies appearing in the free response okay so uh hopefully you can see what's going on I can activate any of these frequencies and bring any of them in by choosing my initial conditions. And another, to make it even more interesting for you, I want you to see which one of these uh, two frequencies in X1 and X2, it has bigger coefficients, it has bigger weight. Well, if you look at frequency 1 in both of them, the weights are 1.09 and 0.71, while in mode uh, for frequency 2, the gains are negative 0 0.09 and 0 0.28. Clearly see these two weights of frequency 2 are smaller than frequency 1. Why is that? Because in this case, although x naught is not parallel collinear with any of the two mode shapes, but it's closer to V1 than to V2. Why? Because first of all, you see that... Both of them are in the same direction, 1 and 1. And that matches what? That matches V1. Here, V1, although they are both negative, but they are in the same direction. Here, they are in the opposite direction. Okay? Yes? So, uh, how can I see which one is closer mathematically? You can use a dot product. So, if I dot product this initial condition, uh, vector uh, x0 with V1, the value is negative 1.38. If I dot product it with what? With V2, then the value is negative 0.639. And clearly the absolute value is bigger than what? Is uh, bigger than the absolute value of the other one. So in this case, a vector x naught is closer to V1. That's why the gains of that are bigger. Now you might say, could I predict these gains from x naught and v1 and v2? Was there a way to predict these four gains in blue and green? Was there any way to analytically calculate them if I knew my v1 and v2 and if I knew my x0? The answer is yes, you can. How? Let me show you. So in general, if you have a system uh, here, a 2D OF system, uh, starting from rest with some non-zero initial condition, you can show that the free response of the system is what is equal to. If you combine x1 and x2 into a vector x, in this case, so that's this vector x, it's going to be some number a times uh, the first mode shape, v1, 
times cosine of frequency 1 times t plus another number b times v2 times cosine of frequency number 2, just as you can see here. Okay, and then how would you get numbers a and b? Well, in this formula, you just plug in time of 0. If you do that, these cosines will be 1. So you get av1 plus bv2 equals vector x0 and then you can write this by combining v1 and v2 into a matrix uh, which you might call it matrix v and those a and b into a uh, column vector the unknown vector basically and this is equal to x0 so now in order to find a and b you need to invert this uh, v1 v2 matrix multiplied by x0 and that will give you both gains a and B. By the way, the matrix that is formed by putting the mode shapes next to each other, we call it the modal matrix. We call it what? The modal matrix. Remember that these are, these uh, Vs and the uh, lambdas or omegas in this case, they are what? They are the um, uh, uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors of which matrix? Matrix negative M inverse times K. So if that's the case, you can write this matrix as what? You can write it as... Uh, first, you need to, before you write it, you need to call this matrix V1 and V2 something. So I call it matrix V. So you can write it as basically V times a diagonal matrix D times V transpose. V is clear and this diagonal matrix in this case it has what in it? It has basically these eigenvalues squared or the lambdas, right? So it's going to be like lambda 1 and lambda 2 and 0 and 0. It's a diagonal matrix with eigenvalues on the diagonal. Okay, and you can write it like that. Okay, we call it eigenvalue decomposition. So this V is a very important matrix. We call it the modal matrix. And you see the invert of, inverse of that times initial condition will give you those two constants A and B. And in this case, I'll show you that if we use this formula, we could exactly find what A and B. So here, let me show you my MATLAB code. So here is my MATLAB code. This is the M matrix. This is the K matrix. This is A matrix, which is negative inverse of M times K. I found the eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I called them uh, V1 and V2. And then omegas are, or lambdas, if you don't want to call them that, you can call them omegas, right? And uh, yeah, let me call them omegas instead of lambdas. So omega N1 and omega N2 are the square root of the diagonal entries. And then, um, so this is just to give you the uh, mode shapes and the uh, natural frequencies, right? So you see, these are my natural frequencies and these are those mode shapes I showed you. And now to show you how to use the command dsolve, here I define time x1 of t and x2 of t symbolic. I define my differential equations as x1 double dot equals negative 50 x1 minus x2 and x2 double dot equals 100 x1 minus 170 x2 and those numbers are again coming from uh, basically uh, this matrix here. And so um, then I define the, the first derivative of x1 with respect to 2 and x2 with respect to t as dx1 and dx2 because I need them for initial conditions. So now what are my initial conditions? Is x1 at uh, 0 is 1, x1 dot at 0 is 0, x2 at 0 is the ratio of v to 1 to v11, right? So I'm choosing what? The ratio of the two numbers in this vector v1 or you could say V11 over V12, something like that, right? V12 over V11. Uh, so you could have done that if you wanted to. You could say V12 divided by what? V11. That's the same thing. So basically, if you choose one of them as 1, it finds the other one as 0.6547. 
And of course, the derivative of x2 at time 0 is also 0. So you have four initial conditions. Then you pass the equations and the initial conditions to the command dsolve to get you solutions. Also pay attention that when you define your um, initial conditions or your uh, or the ODEs, uh, when you use equal sign, you have to use double equal sign. So you use the solution, and then the solution, when it gives you, it has a bunch of uh, ratios with a lot of uh, digits. So in order to convert them into decimals, I use the VPA command with five places. And uh, the solution x sol here is a structure, so you need to use dot x1 and dot x2 to get the uh, solutions x1 and x2, and then again convert it into decimals instead of ratio of big numbers. And that will give you what? That will give you uh, basically um, the solution. So if I run this portion for you, look. So the symbolic, uh, yeah, seems like it was uh, not happy. And the reason is these are not capital letters. Okay, these are small letters. So I'll do it one more time. It should give me the solution. Symbolic takes it a little bit time, but you see here, here the only frequency activated is frequency one. And again, you see these weights are the same as my initial conditions. Okay, so this was when I only activated the first mode. If you want to activate the second mode, now you can go to V2 of two over V2 of one. Right, so choose one of them as one, the other one is the ratio of the two numbers. Again, the velocity is zero, change the initial condition and activate it again. Now you should see only frequency two is activated, as you can see. And again, the ratio of the weights is the same as the initial conditions. And finally, if I go and use one and one for initial conditions, now you should get what? Both of the uh, frequencies activated as I told you. And the question was, can I get these four numbers here from a formula? And the answer is yes, you can. So here, if I define a variable temp and that is equal to inverse of the V and V is V1, right? And V2. Let's make sure dimensions match, yes. Then times what? Times the initial condition, which was one and one in this case, right? If I do that, so this should be A and this should be B, and you might say, well, these two numbers have nothing to do with these four numbers. That's right, because those are not those weights. These are just the numbers that you have to multiply by V1 and V2 to get them, remember? The number is a v1 and b v2, not just a and b. So I have to multiply a by v1. I have to multiply b by v2 to see the effect. So here I use temp number one, which is a. All right, let's go back. So a is that, and b is temp number two. And now a times v1 and b times v2. Look at the numbers. 1.09.71, look, 1.09.71, and the other numbers should be negative 0.09 and 0 0.28. There we go. Do you see that? So I can get those from this uh, solution I provided. So basically using the mode shapes and the initial condition, you should be able to what? to activate any of the mode shapes with any amount of weight that you want. The closer it is to any of the mode shapes, the weights of that guy are going to be what? Bigger. That's what it is. That's another way to do it. And also, if you go to continuous system like a string, the same effect is um, uh, observable. You can see that. So here, if I have what we call a fix-fix string, so we attach a string from the two ends to the wall, right? And then uh, go ahead and uh, look at the free vibrations. So neglect any damping in the system and assume that uh, it's going to oscillate uh, 
like steadily, continuously, nonstop, then um, there are, in this case, there are infinitely many frequencies and infinitely many mode shapes because this continuous system has infinitely many mass particles. What are those frequencies? What are the mode shapes in this case? The frequencies, you can show that, they are the frequency Fn, where n is the nth frequencies, n over 2L, where L here is what? The length of the rope. Uh, over square root of t over rho. t here is the tension in the rope and rho is the mass density. Okay, so uh, let me uh, write it for you. This is the tension in the string or rope and this is the mass density. So of course if you pull a string harder and vibrate it or use a thicker spring, uh, a string you are going to have different frequencies, and that's exactly what you see in a guitar, right? If you see in a guitar, the size of the strings are different, right? From high pitch to low pitch, you get basically thicker and uh, thicker uh, wires, and you can change the frequencies by using basically the um, pegs on the top and increase the tension. So these are the frequencies, and the much I'll, I'll make a video on that, but... Uh, the mode shapes are sine functions, sine of n pi over x l, where x here is basically the position along the rope, so it's measured from one end. And um, clearly you see there is a sine wave here. So when n is 1, the function is going to be sine of pi x over l, so at x of 0 is sine of 0, at x of l is sine of pi, so both will be 0 and 0. So the only nodes you have are at the ends where they are fixed. But if n becomes 2, now you get sine of 2 pi xl. So now not only you can get 0 displacement at the beginning and at the end, also you get 1 at l over 2. So you get 1, 0 displacement here at the middle. And remember, this point or these guys are called what? Remember, these guys are called nodes. So you'll get some nodes depending on the mode shape. The first one doesn't have any node in the middle. The second one does have one. The uh, third one has two. Thir uh, fourth one has three and so on and so forth, right? So these are different mode shapes. And by the way, let me tell you another term now that we are here. These points that move the max, these points that move the max, these points are what we call untie nodes. Let me just tell you this term right now that we are here, just for your knowledge. As I said, I'm going to make a video on the uh, vibrations of the string. But here, again, we can activate only that frequency if we want by making sure when you pluck the string, when you move it up and release it, if you pluck it in the middle and release it and try to form this sine function and then let go, so in this case, your function x0, right, or you might call it f0 uh, at time 0 or uh, x0, right, something like that. So in this case, you might call it x at time 0, right? If this is the shape of these functions, in this case equals sine of pi x over L, then the only frequency that you will hear from this string is only the first frequency, which is basically square root of t over rho divided by 2L. So n is going to be 1. Here, the shape of x at time 0 should be what? Should be the second mode shape, sine of pi times 2x over L. So here you have to give it this kind of form. So you have to plug here and here and try to keep this middle fixed. If you let go, then the only frequency you will hear is what? Two times that frequency. So a two and a two will cancel. You'll get this. And here uh, you have to basically create the uh, higher pitch sine wave in the beginning. Okay. And that's what a guitarist does. Mostly, uh, they change the length, of course, right? 
to change the frequency by putting their fingers on the frets. But in general, depending on how, with what initial condition, what shape, you start the vibration, the free vibration, only those frequencies will be activated. Okay, so uh, hopefully this video was clear and motivating enough so you know the real meaning of mode shapes. Thank you so much for your attention. And by the way, before I finish, I'm going to share this guy with you. And I'm going to um, put the link under the video description. I will also add this part that we did this temp thing, right? And um, let me add it right now before I forget. So you can see those weights as well. So remember here, we um, found temp, we did A and B, and then A times V1 and B times V2 gave us the same gains as the desolve commanded. So um, I'll share this, the download under video description, take a look at it, and if you want, you can basically add to the degrees of freedom and look at the uh, mode shapes and uh, the effect of them on the free response magnitudes and the weights. Thank you so much. I'll see you in the next video.